Do you have a favorite? Not meant to. But mostly the unloved ones, the unvisited ones, the cases that get dusty and ignored. All the broken and shunned creatures. Someone's got to care for them. Who shall it be if not us? Yes. Welcome to Rune Soup, a weekly podcast about magic, culture, and the very best new and old ideas for living in this world. Coming to you from 43 degrees south on a small farm in deepest Tasmania. My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. This week, we welcome to the show fellow podcaster, Laura London. Laura has a background in neuroscience, kundalini yoga, transcendental meditation, and astrology. She also hosts one of my favorite podcasts, Speaking of Jung, and joins us today to, you know, speak about Jung. Enjoy. Laura London, welcome aboard. Hi, Gordon. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate your interest. Oh, absolutely. Um, you have a fantastic name, by the way. It's like something out of a spy I? novel. I think Laura <laughs> London. It's it's a, it's a hero in like a 1930s, 40s spy novel for sure. Oh, oh. Well, thank you. It's my name. <laughs> That's great. Well, speaking of name, it um, yeah. it must have come with uh, with a child at some point, and that will bring us to our traditional first question, Laura. Oh, were you a weird kid? Yes, very weird. Um, and I, I have a very strong sensation function. And so I'm going to talk about what I was like on the outside. I have wild, frizzy, curly hair. And right now it is keratin treated. So it's straightened. But I didn't get my first keratin treatment until uh, I think it was 2016. So it was three years ago. But I had crazy wild hair. I had. Um, like a busted up nose, um, had that fixed too. I had crooked teeth. I can't believe I'm saying all this. And I was just wild. I was just outrageous and um, aggressive and combative. And my mom just wanted, you know, she had my brother and then she wanted a little girl and I just didn't fit the mold. So, yeah. I was a weird kid. Wonderful. Were you, like, when you say wild, yeah, do you mean combative mm-hmm. as well as sort of, well, I'm going to wander off into the woods now? Wander off into the woods? No, because I, I was scared. You know, I, I was born in New York City, and both of my parents grew up in New York City, and um, I grew up in New Jersey, so I was kind of a, a bit hyper vigilant and, and guarded and kept to myself and spent a lot of time alone in my room. Um, so I wasn't brave. I was just, you know, I had this really rich inner life and I was interested in things that most people, most other people weren't interested in. And I knew things and I had interesting dreams and out of body type experiences. And I believed in aliens and ghosts and I was psychic as a child and sort of still am. So in that sense. Yeah, that's um, that's the kind of stuff we like to talk about around here. I mean, mm-hmm. if we want to go to those uh, high strange or psychic experiences, particularly the dreams and, you know, maybe OBE stuff, were they spontaneous? Uh, I, I kind of had similar stuff growing up, uh, sleep paralysis, hag attack kind of things that are either, mm. you know, in my head slash actually happening slash what's even the difference. Was it, was it stuff like that? It was... It was spontaneous, yes. Um, I I think that I was exposed to a lot of that as a child. I, like I said, I grew up in New Jersey, and we I grew up going to a school that had a lot of resources. I'm I mean, it was kind of a an upper middle class neighborhood, and so we went on a lot of field trips, and we went out of state, and I also traveled a lot. My father was a businessman and he traveled. And so, you know, I've been flying on airplanes since I was five years old and uh, you know, went to Walt Disney World as, as soon as it opened. And um, I, 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 you know, UFOs were this big thing when I was growing up and all these 
television shows with space themes and I dream of genie and so I believed in magic and spells and potions and and just all of that and I would dream that I would fly and I would go places and yeah that whole thing nice and I you know I really didn't have anybody to talk to about it yeah that's um... and, and I I didn't know what was happening but I just had this really rich vivid wild imagination are there any books from the time that stick with you as being resonant or um that you in some sense found your, yourself in if you have a rich inner life and you have these encounters on your own typically people find you know novel series or something where they're like whoa this is um this is unexpectedly potent you know, no, because I think that I was always trying to ground myself. And so I always wanted to be normal. And I, um, we had, my brother and I had horses, we, as, as children. And so that was very grounding. And um, he, my brother was in sports. And so I would go to his sporting activities and go to his games. And my dad was a coach. And that was all very grounding. So I, I just kind of maybe lived in two worlds, I think. Um, and so there was this world at night and then there was this world during the day. And I was very consci- a very conscientious student and I wanted to do well in school. So I did my homework, you know, and I played musical instruments. And like I said, we had horses. So I was very, in- I was very active with quote unquote normal things. I like having people who've uh, who have some experience of Jungian analysis on the show because when I ask the weird kid oh. question, you can tell they've already done some work on it, like uh, understanding that the horses were grounding and 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 sort of realizing mm. there there's there's you, uh, the nightlife and the day life version of uh, Laura and so on. Like I think that's uh, it's really fascinating to hear subsequent descriptions of people who end up on the show and whether they've really sat with, oh, was, was I weird? Was I not weird? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And to this day, I use sports to ground myself um, involved in sports. And I, I, I had just last week, um, in fact, it was a week ago today, I had this big furniture delivery and it was snowing. And these two goons, I'm sorry, but they were rough. And they were speaking in some language I couldn't quite put my finger on, and they were ignoring me, and they were dirty and messy, and it, it, a whole long story. But I kept a sports radio station on on my iPad the entire time they were here because I was I would have lost my mind um, at just how inconsiderate they were, and I just knew that I needed to stay calm. And instead of see, I'm not typical. Instead of putting on some <laughs> new age music or some harp music or do you know what I mean? Something like that chanting. I put on a Boston sports radio channel (laughs) and uh, to, to stay grounded. And so another weirdness of mine. Nice one. Well, from a, a biographical perspective, again, there, there's a sort of mm. a, a bifurcation there because you did go on to uh, study very precise and, and grounding things. Uh, and so I don't know which question you want to ask first, whether it was um, how and when did you first find Jung or mm-hmm. uh, what was the decision making? Is it Was it part of that quest for um, grounding and, and normalcy that, that sort of led you into the sciences to begin? I think it was a desire for depth. I was never satisfied with what I was getting. And I was listening to, because of the podcast and my interest in Jung, this is just, there's so much here. Uh, Let me try to answer your question first. And I can't even, my brain's bad, so I can't remember what it was. But you asked about my interest in Jung and... um, Basically, had you encountered Jung before you went uh-huh. into uh, your sort of version one of uh, higher education? Because that, the trajectories are parallel but different. Mm-hmm. No, I I was always interested in psychology, and I saw the st- the school psychologist when I was in high school, just because I was interested in you know why I was different. Um, why I was just so unsatisfied with 
school and with my life and I wanted more and I didn't know why and I was just bored with it all. So I wanted some depth and, um, you know, I had left New Jersey and, and this is a whole other story, but, um, I was going to a really small high school outside of Washington, DC. And then I, um, my family moved to Seattle. And so I graduated from high school actually out in Seattle, but which was a completely different experience than the high school in DC. But I was basically, I was interested in psychology I had heard of Jung um, because through a course in college, a transpersonal psychology course, but I was just kind of, you know, dabbling and I was not satisfied still with what I was learning. And it, it was a long journey to get to Jung and it was going through a lot of different um, psychologists and therapists, just because nothing was really wrong with me. I just was curious about myself and I wanted to understand more. I wanted to understand myself and I wanted to understand other people. And I never ha- was diagnosed with a mental illness or anything. I, again, like I said, I was curious. So it wasn't until I after I graduated from college, um, I did have a degree in psychology, but I think what was interesting about it was I started off in social and experimental psychology at the University of Washington, and then I transferred to a very small Jesuit school in Cleveland that had a neuroscience department. So I studied psychopharmacology and neuroscience. I had got a concentration in neuroscience and studied the brain and so I learned that whole aspect of it. And then after I graduated from college, I went to work at University Hospitals of Cleveland and Case Western Reserve University's School of Medicine, where it was all in, I worked in nuclear medicine and it was all in um, brain science. And I was a research assistant. And so that was not satisfying at all, but I'm glad I, I learned all that. And then so long story short, I found Jung because I had a series of bodywork sessions done. And when I finished the series, I, I wanted to continue to explore what was going on. At the time I, I had I had gotten married and um I just I don't know, I just felt it was just I was just in a weird place where I thought, okay, now what? And there was a Jungian analyst in training in the same office as the bodywork practitioner. It was Heller work. And so I started seeing her and then um, she completed the training program and became a Jungian analyst. And then what I really want to say, and I just started um, talking about this more and more on, on my podcast and also on my YouTube channel is my fear is that I've sent the wrong message in that, um, you know, I'm very active on social media and yet you and I follow each other on Twitter. I don't think we've connected on Facebook, but um, I'm there too. And I, when I first got on social media, it wasn't to share so much things about what I was doing or photos of myself. It was, I wanted to share what I was learning because I thought it was interesting. And I just wanted to put it out there for anybody else that might be interested too. And so um, what I started doing is quoting, uh, sharing quotes from whatever it was I was reading. And I was typically reading a book written by a Jungian analyst. And before I started reading Jung, I started reading Jungian analysts because I got involved, I think, pretty young uh, in this. And Jung was just too difficult for me to read. Jung is not easy to read. I mean, still to this day, and I, I've had analysts tell me that too, Jung is quite difficult to read and to understand. And if anybody disagrees with that, then maybe you're not really um, reading it and retaining it or reading it at the depth that it was written, because it's very deep stuff. And for me, I can just read a little bit and walk away to to kind of process everything I just read. But anyway, so I was quoting analysts and um, this 
all happened after my analysis, pretty much. So I had a very lengthy analysis. And, and what, I, what I wanted to say was that um, what's come out after, um, you know, because I've learned a lot in the three, has it been three years that I've been doing the podcast? Almost four. I started in 2015. It was in the fall of 2015. And so, um, what I've learned since then is that there's really two different things going on here. There is the experience of Jung, right? And what goes on in analysis, in analysis, the relationship of the analysand and the analyst, that is very important. And then reading Jung and understanding Jung intellectually is kind of something else entirely. And I've had just the past few episodes I've done, I've been discussing this more with the analysts about does this help or hurt when we're in analysis? And it's not necessary to understand Jung when you're in analysis and it, it can be a bit of a hindrance. So anyway, this all came about my my deep um and and uh kind of, what do I want to say, the, all this in-depth reading, you know, acquiring the collected works and the two-volume set of letters and all of these, all, just all of these other pieces of Jung and then all of these books by analysts. I mean, I just have so many now, um, ha- came after my analysis. So, I kind of like want to understand what I went through. I don't even remember what your question was. No, I'm sorry. No, that was this is fascinating because I, I have noticed, uh, and you started off saying you've observed some concerns when you began sharing things, um, and and I I really like this. And in a recent episode, mm-hmm. you said being uh, I've decided to be extremely precise with when I'm using quotations from analysts or especially Jung, because you've seen stuff attributed to him that isn't his yeah. for a start. Yeah. And I'm just wondering if that, because funnily enough, this is one of the conversations I want to have, which is, uh, are there different Jungs and, and is it okay? Or, or what are the implications for Jung as a um, published phenomenon and philosopher or metaphysician as well as being a clinician, is it okay for that to uh, get away from – this makes it sound more negative than I mean it. Is it okay Okay. for them to get away – is it okay for Jung to jailbreak itself from an analytical context? Because we've had the 20th century where Jung belongs with – the analysts, and in particular, as more and more books come out and, and post Red Book and so on, there's now Jung um, available to all as specifically a published metaphysical phenomenon. And and I'm very interested in not who owns him, but like, are there two yeah. Jungs? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And there was a conference called Who's Jung? And uh, that was a group of analysts talking about that. That, that very thing. And I haven't uh, gotten into that yet as far as I would like to. I've been trying. What I'd like people to know is that just because an analyst has not been on my podcast doesn't mean I haven't tried to get them. Yeah. <laughs> Some of them oh, don't. Oh, I feel res- that. Yeah. Right? Some of them, I just want to go on record here. Some of them don't respond at all to me. Some of them say yes and then disappear. And some of them say no. Not a lot say no. Most of them that the, instead of saying no, they just won't respond. But there are a handful of names that people would know who have said yes and now won't re- won't return my email. And that could be a reflection of me. It could be that it could be a lot of things. Yes, it definitely so, could. Right. So I do want to talk to some of those analysts that were at that conference and that may be happening. So as far as Jung is concerned, I mean, it is, I get overwhelmed every day and going back to what you said about the quotes, I can't stand seeing quotes attributed to Jung without a citation. And that's why now I will always have a citation now that, 
on to because I'm mostly on Twitter. Now that on Twitter there are more characters, they're double the amount. It used to be 140, now there's 280. I can include where I where the quote is from. And if it's not in that tweet, then I will thread it so that it is attached to a tweet that has the citation. Um, but yeah, what I had said on my podcast is I saw someone that I follow um, quote Jung, and this person is not a Jungian, and I was happy, and I read it, and I thought, I like that quote, but I don't think he said that. So I searched through the collected works because I have the digital edition, which is great because you can search it, and which I have that open right now in case we need something. And sure enough, I found something similar to that, but it was not exact and it was far enough away where I think it kind of changed the meaning. So that's why, um, that's why I said that. And as far as analysts, well, Jung's not here anymore. And so we have, we have his writings and they're overwhelming. There's so many. And I always say this, most of what Jung wrote has not even been published yet. Um, but that's ongoing through the Philemon foundation. And I think maybe even through others. So, yeah, it's important to me that it it's what he said and not some twisted version of what he said because it sounds witty or convenient. Do you know what I mean? No, absolutely. Um, I actually had a question about, you know, what percentage estimated of, of Jung's work are actually published. And it kind of comes back to, again, I don't want to use ownership, like who owns Jung, but it kind of comes back to, is anyone even in a position to uh, describe a canonical Jung, if that makes sense, given that the... Uh, the the really late release of the the red book for instance kind of i think permanently changed the game given when he wrote it so young and the fact that the system he built is in many respects an after effect of of that of those exercises for that time and then all of a sudden you have well well he built this system of psychology more or less single handedly but then it, then in this century we find out and he did that by doing something that is you know uh, has wider metaphysical implications than is in the system that he put together. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Oh, um, the the implications of the Red Book are, mm -hmm. um, I think, far wider than are typically described from a quote unquote official depth psychological position. Given that you, um, it involved basically ritual. It looks like ritual magic because it, it sort of is. You know, you're, you're constructing things and and, uh, and and going on on journeys that would be called journeys in a shamanic context, and and bringing out and and physicalizing the um, subsequent experiences. And and all of that was profoundly transformative for him, and that happened quite young in his life. And uh, and he you know specifically said let's not publish this so i wonder if there do you think mm -hmm. there's going to be any more it's inevitable perhaps maybe not to the level of the red book but given how that the a majority of jung's writing uh, is not yet widely available do you think there are any other surprises like that in there <laughs> yes okay a, a few things um there are i think that oh th there's so much here in what you said which was great um I think that Jung started work on the Red Book in, I've heard 1913 and I've heard 1914. So he was 38 years old, which is technically the beginning of the midlife period. So the quote unquote midlife crisis. That's the time that he wrote the book. He worked on it for 16 years and he worked on it. He went back and forth. He, from what I understand, he never said, do not publish this. Oh, really? He, he never thought about publishing it. He shared some of it with his friends, his close associates. He shared parts of it. I had known about the Red Book and seen uh, some of the paintings that he had done way before the Red Book was published because they're in C.G. Jung, Word and Image. And then in his autobiography that was there's some controversy over that word. He kind of dictated memories, dreams, reflections to his secretary, who later became an analyst herself, Anila Yaffe. 
um, there, there's a section in there about the Red Book. So, what what had happened as far as publication? Th- there's there's a bunch of things here I, that I don't want to slip through the cracks. First of all, who owns Jung? His family of heirs owns everything. So Jung had five children. They're all deceased. Um, the final one died, I think, in 2014. He had four daughters and one son. And they have children. Some of them went on to become analysts. Um, so there are architects and analysts in the family, and they are vi- they still live in that house of his, the family home that he built on the shore of Lake Zurich in Kusnacht. And they own all the rights to all of his stuff. Now, what else? Uh, ritual magic. I think that that might be an interpretation of what went on in the Red Book. Jung called it active imagination. Mm-hmm. Um, there, one of the reasons why the family, and specifically Jung's son, who I think he died in ninety six. Uh, I'm not sure. I was just reading about that. It may have been a little later. Um, I could look that up. He said no that the he did not want that Jung's son did not want the red book published you know the swiss are very private people and his family is very protective of him as i would be because this is not well understood this material is not well understood i think jungians understand it but if you're looking at it from the outside it could look like a madman or it could look like psychosis and then there was an episode of a television show here in the United States called Law and Order that brought in the red book featured the red book I didn't see the episode I heard about it and likened it to some or it attached it to some sort of satanic cult <laughs> it's it's not well understood and that's the danger of putting things out there that that can be misinterpreted. Um, I, this is going to come across really harsh, but I don't care. But I have a friend that says, do not cast pearls before swine. Don't take that literally. But do you know what I mean? Like even with religions that are esoteric, they have hidden knowledge that's only available to the initiates. Like right now, I, I talk to a Tibetan Buddhist Lama every day um, that I had met when he was on tour here in the United States, I'm helping him with his English. So we do a one hour Skype session every morning and, and then we chat um, because he's a philosophy teacher and I ask him questions and I can always tell when he just doesn't want to pass that information along to me because I am not, I have not taken the Bodhisattva vow. You know, I'm not, I'm not a Tibetan Buddhist. So there, there's stuff that I just, he just can't tell me. Oh, look, I, I love that. And yeah. I, I, um, I completely get what you're saying, but it kind yeah. of comes back to the question of uh, can you own or who gets to own if we're talking initiates and not? And it's an open question I can't, I haven't landed on. This is mm-hmm. literally why I'm asking is um, who gets to own Jung? Like, because you just used initiates and, and revealed text and so on as an example. So is there a Jung outside? Is there a canonical or even legitimate Jung outside a clinical or analytical, but is better, um, official analytical context? And I, I, I think there is. Mm-hmm. I think just on a mm-hmm. cultural analysis phenomenon yeah. perspective, I can go and buy his books in a shop. So right. I think there is, but I don't know what that is or, or, or what the implications for that are. And I, and I thought you'd be a really great person to ask because of, you know, all your wonderful conversations with, with analysts and your, your much better understanding yeah. of the material than me. Well, I, I'm, I still don't know that I know enough to answer your question, but I did go to Zurich because I wanted to – I wanted, I, I needed to, I'm very big on face-to-face meeting and talking to people face-to-face and looking them in the eye and sitting down with them and having a meal with them. And I needed to do that. So I went to Zurich and I didn't get to go inside his house, but I went to his house. I was inside his office at the old C.G. Jung Institute, which is now the Psychological Club in Zurich. I met with its president. 
He gave me a, a private tour. Uh, I sat with him. I talked to him. He showed me a lot of Jung's items. And and then I did, um, how many interviews did I do? I, I recorded two episodes of the podcast there um, with two notable analysts who live and practice in Zurich. And so for me, when I first started the podcast, I I said, I only want to interview Zurich trained analysts because I want to go as as close to the source as I possibly can. I wasn't being a snob like I was accused of being. I wanted to get, I really wanted to get the the oldest generation of analysts I could get because Suzanne Wagner at the of the C.G. Jung Institute of Los Angeles interviewed Jung's the people who knew Jung and worked with Jung. There's a whole series of interviews out there with them. I wanted to get the next generation. And those people, I cannot even count how many analysts have passed away since I started doing this podcast. It's unbelievable. They're we're losing them. And I have an at the next analyst I'm going to be interviewing, I think she's close to 80 years old. I mean, I'm sorry, but that's old. That's that's old to still be, to me, to still be working. Um, and I want to get these stories, you know? Understood. So, so as far as who owns Jung, um, do you mean the interpretation of his material? Well, yeah, because if if I can go and buy the books and read them myself, and, mm-hmm. and I'm not in analysis, um, although if I, I'd love to at some stage, but uh, if I can go and get the books and read them myself, yeah, what Jung is that? Do you know what I mean? And and this is this is a twenty first yeah. century version. It's a twenty first century publishing phenomenon. So he's in danger, which I think is remarkable, given that he's dead. He's in danger of kind of changing our understanding of our minds two centuries in a row, which no one has ever done before, because you know the twentieth century, which is the one that he lived through most of, obviously from the nineteenth, mm-hmm. uh, and then all of a sudden. Uh, the the wider interest and in, and the the affordability in many respects and increasing availability of of Jung and the analyst books that you um, read and discuss on your show and and so on means there is there's another one do you know what I mean there's there's the an, there's Jung in an analytical context and then there's Jung as yeah. a cultural and I think right. about it from a postmodern perspective but that has some form of legitimacy. Um, it's different, but I'm, I'm very interested in what your opinions are. Well, how, how does Jung in the wild, how do you feel about Jung in the, in the cultural wild, I guess? I don't feel good about it because this is, this is work at a very deep level and it's dangerous. Psychoanalysis is dangerous. When you are going into the unconscious and when you are working with an analyst and their unconscious is involved and your unconscious is involved, it's very dangerous. And that's why, another reason why I started the podcast is to feature the work of Jungian analysts to show how they are different from pop psychologists, behavioral therapists, counselors, do you know what I mean? Social workers. It's a very different thing. And it's not necessarily people who are in crisis who go to a Jungian analyst or have been diagnosed with something. It's about somebody that wants to go deeper because they're, they know that there's more there. And I'm still now, only now, beginning to see the difference When you're in analysis, you're not talking about the anima and the animus and Mm -hmm. what's my type. We didn't do any of that. I was in analysis for 17 years. And my analyst, she's, I think she's 70 years old now. She's still practicing. She's in Cleveland. And... I've been asking her um, if I could do an episode of the podcast with her. We haven't done one yet. She just released a book last year. So I'd like her to come on and talk about that book. But we didn't talk about it. We didn't, she didn't use these terms. And because it, this is not a, when you're in analysis, you're not talking about Jung's theories. You're having an experience. 
you're ex- looking at your dreams, you're having a dialogue, you're the analyst is you know, making what's in your unconscious conscious. And that's not about Jung. The analyst is trained to do what they do. And you as an analysand aren't worried about any of that stuff. In fact, I think it would it would have taken me out of it. I would have thought, well, wait a minute, isn't this my animus, you know? And mm. no, 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 it doesn't work like that. So that's why I'm starting to get very uncomfortable with what am I doing here? Because another purpose of my podcast was to encourage people to enter into analysis. And I cover things like people talking about, well, it's too expensive. Um, You know, I don't have the money. I don't have the time. And there are all these myths out there. And I just want to say for anybody listening, I've had so many analysts tell me that they've never turned anybody away over money, that they'll work something out with you. It isn't like there is a fee, a standard fee, and if you can't afford it, then, you know, I can't see you. It doesn't work like that. So, and I just had somebody email me saying that they, that I was helping her find an analyst and she was asking me, you know, how do I do this? How do I know which analyst is right for me? And so, we, we talked about that. We, I had her call me. We talked on the phone. This is important to me. So, um, and she also said that she was able to work out a fee that would work for her. And she said, thank you for encouraging me to do that. So, um, another thing is, I just want to say, you had asked if there are any more surprises. Yeah. And there is a foundation that was created um, because of the publication of the Red Book. It's called the Philemon Foundation. And one of Jung's inner figures that's featured most prominently in the Red Book is Philemon, this winged old man, which with the with a long beard. I call him Mick Fleetwood. I mean, he looks like Mick Fleetwood. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> he really does. So it's probably the most recognizable figure from that book. And the Philemon Foundation was created to help fund the what went into the publication of the Red Book is Sanu Shamdasani, who he's not an analyst, he's a scholar. He's a Jungian scholar in London. He's a professor. And the Red Book came from Jung's Black Books. And just to make a long story short, the Black Books are going to be published. And I've known for years that they were in the process of being published. So I'd have to go to the Philemon Foundation website, it's philemon.org, to see how close they are. But I, I don't think that this is generally known. How Jung kind of made the Red Book is he had this series of smaller books. And actually, the first one was brown. And it was from, I don't know if it was childhood or young adulthood, where he, was, he would write down his dreams. And any of his other thoughts, or I don't know if he's sketched in there. Um, And then when that was filled up, the next book he got was black. So, and then, and then the one after that and the one after that, and there are a series of them. So they're nicknamed the black books. Well, he took some of what's in the black books and put them in the red book. And Jung was very deliberate in the creation of this red book. He ordered the book. It's huge, red leather bound book with gold on the gold lettering on the spine that says Liber Novus, which is Latin for new book, new book. And the paper is just this exquisite vellum cream colored paper that he lined I think in pencil, very faintly. And then he wrote the Red Book in calligraphy. So this wasn't, this is him, Jung taking from the Black Books and putting them down in the Red Book. And then there are, I think, I wanted to know this exactly. So I wrote it down. There are 53 paintings, kind of like, I think he used gouche paint. Is that is that the name of a kind of paint? Yes, yeah, 53 right. paintings. Okay. And 
and um and it was over 400 pages so and then we could talk about how you know the red book i see i'm i'm very into the physical nature of things and how it was scanned and it, it's an exact facsimile of jung's red book but the red book again is from these black books and the black books are in the process of being published but i just want to say also that um you know this this whole question of whether or not jung intended the red book to be published what happened was there were some there were some parts of the red book that were found outside of zurich so after jung died this red book was put in the bank vault in zurich and it sat there for i think close to 20 years before it was taken out to be scanned to be published but i think that the negotiation that Sanusham Dasani had with the Jung family, I think with specifically with Jung's son, um, that now this is all outlined. There is a New York Times, it wasn't a New York Times newspaper article, it was in the New York Times magazine, written by Sarah Corbett, who was there in Zurich when it was taken out of the bank vault and when it was scanned by the publisher W.W. W. Norton. She she gives an entire chronological history of how this all happened. But I just want to put this out there that there were parts of the book that were out there because who knows, uh, I think a German publisher had a chunk and then somebody else, uh, maybe a British woman. And so the phil- the the people that wanted it published um i'm sure it was more than just sanus shamdasani went to the young family and said this is going to come out do you know what i mean it's uh, going to get out there okay. it's because it it, it there's do you, would you rather have chunks of it released or we do it properly as a, in whole because if you just take chunks of it, and I don't know which chunks they had, then it kind of, I think, would have been out of context. And who knows if it was real or not. So the Red Book that's out there, and I would highly encourage people to stay away from the Reader's Edition because it doesn't contain the art. Um, I know that the book is expensive. I looked at it today because I think the price fluctuates. Um, I mean, the list price, the retail price of the book that's printed inside of it is $295 US, but it is available new on Amazon right now today for $162.90. Um, you know, you, you don't have to buy the book. You can go somewhere and look at it. I mean, Exactly. I don't know if but you I, know, a I, library has it. Go ahead, please. Yeah, no, um, I, I agree. But also, I don't have a problem. Um, I think that's how much a, a physical product, an actual document that had that amount of diligence and, and that sort of content in it, that's what it costs to get it out. Like, we were just talking about bank vaults, and you can go on YouTube and see the uh, incredibly detailed and delicate scanning process that the publisher went through. And if that's the cost of the book... That's what it costs. Like, it, it, you know, I, I, yeah. I like the idea in a weird way. I like the idea that it actually has um, price as well as value. Mm, yeah, and it's heavy. It's it's eighteen inches by twelve inches. It's four hundred and four pages. Uh, the shipping weight is nine point four pounds. And I, I, th- I think I, I mentioned that because I'm a little sensitive right now. I somebody had tweeted me. And tagged some other people too that Jung's entire collected works is available from some illegitimate, okay, illegitimate website, got the PDF versions of all 20 volumes of Jung's collected works and put them out there. And that's, that's just wrong. Um, it's copyright violation and, you know, it, I put my podcast out there for free, just like you do. Um, and no matter how much, and whenever I, I interview an analyst, if they have any of their papers that they'll allow listeners to download for free, 
I put them on the website. Um, no matter how much I put out there, people still want stuff for free. And books like music, I mean, books aren't free. They're not free. And um, yeah, it, it, I don't know. It just kind of disturbs me that people just want to take stuff. And here's how I, maybe this will help because here's how I deal with it. This is extremely common in, in uh, magic. Uh, if you're not going to buy the book, you're not going to do the work. So yeah, it's a copyright violation and all that kind of stuff. And in, particularly in the case of something like the collected works, um, that's, uh, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of copyright violation, right? Um, mm -hmm. the, the people who get the pirate version, I can tell you with, cons with, with a high degree of confidence, uh, they won't read it and they won't do anything with it. It's sort of impossible. There's a, this is what mm. I, this is why I don't have a problem. I mean, it is expensive, but this is why I don't have a problem with the idea that the, um, the, like the proper facsimile, uh, red book costs what it mm. costs because there is, there is a price to be, uh, you, you have to be serious enough with yourself to, to do mm. that kind of stuff. So I know what you mean about seeing all the, all of it out there. And this is, funnily enough, it's kind of a question bringing it back to the podcast, which is, I've heard you a couple of times say on the show that um, one of your motivations for starting it was because you were concerned that Jung was in danger of being forgotten. And yes. we're kind of talking about the opposite thing. So, if you, right. is there a tension there for you? Or is it, a, 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 yeah, a, Put those two things together for me, because we spent a lot of time talking about the opposite thing happening. <laughs> right. Well, I had heard that from analysts, and that in the beginning, when I told them about the podcast, that I was doing this, and when I was, th this is before the podcast existed, and I was throwing the idea out there, and that's what they were telling me, is that it seemed like Jung was being, I don't know if disappeared or forgotten but watered down and 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 yes disappeared and forgotten it just happened oh when i went to the publisher's website today i went to ww w. norton's website the publisher of the red book and uh, instead of just putting red book in the search function i looked at the topics and it said freud and psychoanalysis and i clicked on that and there was the red book <laughs> why didn't it why didn't it say jung yeah Right. So there is just little things, you know, there's Freud everywhere. And I don't know any Freudian analysts. I mean, no, does anybody practice Freudian analysis anymore? But Freud's known and Jung isn't. And Jung is people, you know, see what Russell Brand walk down the street carrying a copy of the Red Book and they associate it with Russell Brand and, and everything that he's about. They watch television law and order and says that you know this is the book of a satanic cult so and i say this too jung is not for everyone jung is not for the masses and another thing that i wanted to mention earlier is that analysts will turn me down to do the podcast because they don't believe in speaking to many people they say that th this work is done one on one it's done in the analytic container. The work is done in the crucible. And that they don't want to speak to the masses or whoever. Because it's not something you can generalize. But th again, there's this difference between Jung's theories and the work we do in analysis. It's different things. So, Jung being forgotten, I think that what Jung really said is being lost. And and here's why I say that. One of the analysts that I've interviewed three times, his, and he, I can say his name because he's talked about it, his name is J. Gary Sparks. I've been to his home. He lives in Indianapolis, Indiana. I, we did our first episode together in person. He is the one who is saying that Jung isn't really being read that much in the analytic training programs i mean that's absurd that's weird i didn't know that yeah. and that and that jung is being watered down when you have groups like the Asheville jung center that's run by a psychiatrist then that's going to happen and that's why i don't want to have anything to do with those people because yeah. that's not jung 
See this, I'm gonna I'm gonna sit with that because I obviously have a. Um, although I'm, I definitely share your concerns, I have a more positive view of a uh, of the longer term impact of a jailbroken Jung. So the material in in interested hands out in culture, I think, um, will have some blowback, but actually may do some beneficial things. But this is interesting for me because it comes back to. Uh, who, who are the swine and who has the pearls? Because if mm -hmm. the people allegedly having the pearls, um, are watering it down or just using it as a, a brand, um, psychiatrists running, yeah. running young centers is, is a challenge. And so it's, th this is really interesting to me because it means that neither house is in order. Um, and that, and I like that. I, I, I don't like that. I, it hadn't occurred to me structurally that that was the case you know um that mm. even within in within the analytical world uh the idea that jung is being read less and less is um yeah that's alarming <laughs> and 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 let me also add about all the splits that have happened with jung's centers jung societies jung institutes just in the united states factions and for instance even here in chicago there was one jung center in Evanston, which is just north of Chicago. And that group split and became two. So now there's the Jung Center in Evanston, and there's the Jung Institute in downtown Chicago. Something I think similar happened in Los Angeles. Some of the analysts didn't get along. They fought. That's going to happen. We're human. We're not going to see eye to eye on everything. And then in Zurich, the Jung Institute, the C.G. Jung Institute, which was created in 1948, right? Some of the people there split and formed the Research and Training Center, according to C.G. Jung and Marie-Louise von Franz, which is now a separate training institute. And then there's ISAP Zurich, the Institute uh, for the Study of Analytical Psychology, I think it's called. So, there was a split even in Zurich. Yeah. Right? So they're they have their own take on it and their own way of structuring things, and their own way of looking at things and emphasizing some things and not others. Is there here's a here's a little thought experiment for us. Is there a way over a multi-century timeline that we can uh interpret the splits and and the uh, publishing of you know new stuff and, and and it getting out into culture in in more affordable or accessible ways over a multi century timeline is this a uh, upwelling from mm -hmm. the unconscious and and are we kind of because of how brief human lives are are we potentially only get, getting giving ourselves an inaccurate view by kind of shrinking down or is it both like shrinking down concerns to uh normal human timelines because it seems to me that you could put what's happening in 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 that context even just as a thought experiment and go well maybe we don't know what's going on maybe this is an upwelling that you know um will be tackled over multiple centuries that i don't know how to answer fair yeah. enough <laughs> yeah i just don't that's way beyond my knowledge I don't know. Um, so what else did you ask that I didn't answer? I'm just looking here. No, I, I think, think that you go. Yeah, no, I just was going to say that I was never, I never wanted to become a cl clinician and that's become clearer and clearer to me. Uh, just personally, I know why. Um, and I'm also not a young scholar. I I think that I'm most comfortable with, say, the work of James Hollis, who I've had on the podcast three times. I met him in 2001. I still attend his lectures. He's coming here to Chicago in April. I'm going to see him again. And that's taking Jung's theories, Jung's psychology, and putting it to practical everyday use. That's what I'm most comfortable with. All the other things that people take from Jung, that's what that's what they take. This is what I'm comfortable with, what works for me, um, what I like to explore, what I like to talk about and share with people. 
shadow work, looking at meaning being more important than happiness, um, just how we most of us live unconsciously and reflexively and defensively. And that's what analysis can do for us is to make us more conscious. And like what Dr. Hollis talks about is it makes our life more interesting. Mm -hmm. That analysis isn't there to fix you. As analysts, they don't fix us, cure us, right? So they they help us to just be more awake and more aware of ourselves. And my my um, one of the things that I like to talk about is this myth of happiness. Dr. Hollis calls it the cult of happiness. And how that as a goal is pretty useless because it's we can have fleeting moments of happiness, but it doesn't have any really any longevity that meaning meaning is more important than happiness because meaning has more durability. So things like that, yeah, that, that are not that are not so heady and not so you know studying Jung because if you read the collected works and it's fascinating and every I after talking to uh, Gary Sparks and also his friend James Shearer, who I recently had on the podcast, that's what they encourage the most is to read Jung. And so to get me, to encourage me, to remind me to read Jung every day, I do something on Twitter. Uh, I try to do it every day and I don't, called the random Jung quote of the day where I just randomly open up the collected works or um, one of the volumes of letters or something else that was written by Jung and just quote from it. The first thing I see. Bibliomancy, so, Jungian bibliomancy. I like it. Exactly. Yes. Yes. And, and then go from there. And so now I, I'm, I've taken it to Facebook too, where I have more room and I could maybe put the whole paragraph or two so that it has some context because that's a, tends to be a problem on Twitter is that there's not much room for context, but I mean, there, there's Jung, Gary Spark says Jung, in theory, should not, is a man so huge, so enormous that he shouldn't have, have existed, but he did. And I do get overwhelmed um, with, there's just so much to him because then people look at his relationships, you know, and his wife and his his second wife or mistress, they look at that and then um, his relationship with his children and his relationship with Freud and why he attracted so many women. And I'm saying, good thing he did attract a lot of women. Good thing he did because it got their attention. Mm. So, and, and that there are, that I've, you know, I've also been criticized for interviewing more men than women. Well, <laughs> Most of the women, the female analysts I ask, those are the ones who tend to say no oh, or that, ignore my... That's not just analysts. Um, I, I start off every month and, and I have to kind of do the ratio thing. And, and it's and I understand being a woman on the internet means they generally just don't want the drama because um, my female guests tend to attract... I don't let them through, but they tend to attract more of the uh, the hostile comments into the into the comment yeah. filter. They get, they're a third of my guests and they get two thirds of the comments. So I completely understand why... It's a funny way of saying it, why women turn me down more than men. But um, <laughs> trust me, it's, right. it's not just analysts. It's it's something you're um, to be congratulated for doing, which is simply being a woman on the internet. <laughs> mm. Well, and and I don't want to hide because then how am I going to have any credibility if I use a fake name and, you know, and then I get criticized for posting pictures of myself? Well, it, yeah. you, you've got to be seen to be believed. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I, yeah, I fully get that. So this is, you mentioned James Hollis. Uh, inevitably, when people talk about Jung, and I still think this is, with my limited knowledge, I still think this is correct, that the first mm -hmm. way into reading Jung is the quote-unquote um, autobiography, um, Memories, Dreams, Reflections, for people oh, who yeah. are, that's the way in. Um, and by the way, for people listening, I've, I've got a printed copy, but the audible version isn't that bad either. So if you're an audiobook 
um, person. It's actually quite interesting to hear, especially as it was dictated and it's gone dictation book to voice again. It's it's an interesting mm-hmm. experience listening to it. Um, would mm-hmm. you say because I people who listen to the show are very interested in um, in the the lived potential of of the content we discuss? Um, would you say James Hollis is like okay? Well, if you want to, if you want your first taste of how uh, of you know analytical perspectives outside of analysis would that be um would that do you know what i mean is is he someone you would maybe direct people who want to go in that direction to well as far as the practical application of jung's theories in everyday life i would say yes sure. but but someone who knew jung i think best and did a lot of writing was Marie-Louise von Franz, who was a collaborator of his. She was she was 18 when she met him and she was with him till his death in 1961. And she's written a lot of books that are very readable. She died in 1998. And so I, I would encourage people to read her books. But as far as Someone who's alive today, um, I think James Hollis, I, I mean, I would highly recommend. And then Marion Woodman, who passed away last year, her th- that was the first thing I read, was her book, Addiction to Perfection, The Still Unravished Bride. Uh, that book, I mean, it's what completely shifted me. Um, I had never come across anything like it. and. When I first got it, I think it was maybe in the late 90s, it was very difficult for me to understand. I was in analysis analysis at the time and and I, I I couldn't get through it. And so I had to put it down for several years. And then I read it and reread it and it it changed it changed my life. I mean, I can I can honestly say that book changed my life and really gave me the foundation of Jung's psychology that I needed, but that, but that's me, you know, Mm. I think that everybody needs to find what speaks to them. And I hear a lot of analysts that I, that I interview or just chat with say that it was a book of Jung's that they first saw or somebody gave them or I mean, James Hollis talks about how he saw one of Jung's books in a bookstore, a little paperback book. And he bought it and he like didn't have much money or something and 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 that changed everything for him because he was a professor and i think he was an a english lit professor for many years before he became a jungian analyst so it's different for everyone and and, and find that this is yeah. one of the things let me just fanboy about the show so i have my weird kid question that i ask every time when i listen to your show <laughs> I love hearing how the analysts you talk to uh, end up where they are because it is in every case it is Jungian like it's it's a book across a secondhand bookstore that for some reason resonated with them without at, at, to walk across the shop or whatever it happens to be it, right. I, I from what we have guests like um, Dr. Jeff Kripal who's um, oh, yeah. chair of religion and, and very interested mm-hmm. in comparison and I look at the stories or listen rather to the stories that your guests um, tell you about how they become analysts and it's an oversimplification but a useful one to say this is a uh, this is like a shamanic journey, or it's a UFO contact experience, or mm-hmm. the, the the stories are that kind of they have that structure, and and it's yeah. sort of and at the end of it, it's like and now I'm an analyst, and and it's remarkable yeah. every single time, and I think that's amazing. I love hearing them. I love hearing. Never stop asking them how they become analysts because uh, it's always fascinating. Thank you for mentioning that. I'm. I, yeah, I want to. Definitely uh, um, pay more attention to to that, and and I, I appreciate you sharing that with me because that that is important. And um, I'm fumbling around here like I always do. I start going blank. I just I get overwhelmed with thoughts like I want to say this and I want to say that, <laughs> and it's just this jumbled mess. And I'm not very articulate. I mean, I'm not. You know, I'm not a clinician. I'm not a scholar. I'm not articulate. I'm not really much of anything. But 
interested and passionate about this. And I also really like to highlight that what it takes to become an analyst, because one of the analysts said to me that uh, she had a friend ask her, oh, so, you know, how do you, uh, uh, most of them have uh, graduate degrees. You have to have a graduate degree in order to enter the training program. So you have to have either a master's or a PhD or an MD before you can be accepted by a training program to become a Jungian analyst. And so she had a friend, I don't know if she was a clinical psychologist or what, ask her, oh, so this is just like a weekend course you take <laughs> and to become an analyst? And she said, no, it took me seven years. And then they say, you know, forget it. And they don't bother. So these people who are Jungian analysts, the commitment and the time that they've put into this, I have so much respect mm. for. I know I couldn't do it. No. Um, the recent guest name currently escapes me. Who began as a dentist, and and, the, and so it's oh it's, yeah, it's James a, Shearer. J- yeah, mm-hmm. it's a career change uh, and a huge one because he actually moved, you know, to Zurich, but and managed to become like or work as a dentist there. But like yeah. to, to to leave, you know, the Midwest um, right. where you are a dentist. Uh, I, it's. Teeth and and young are not actually connected. That's brave. Right. That is so well, impressive. And, you know, when you yeah, and they talk about being called. You know, it's a calling, mm. and that's what the word vocation means. So it, it's it's almost where you get to the point where you you can't not you you, you have to do it. What do I want want to say? You can't not do it. This is the shamanic structure. Um, this is what fascinates me about okay. listening because you, um, nobody chooses to be a shaman. That's because it, generally it's a terrible job, but, um, nobody chooses it. It, it, it chooses you. And, yeah. and that, that structural component, I, I listen and, and you see that in basically every case of, of when you've asked a question that I can think of, which is mm. it chose them rather than, you know, they have an interest in it. Sure. But it chose them and, and, and especially as they warm up with you and they start telling you more of the um the sort of ex- the more extreme synchronicities that come along with that particular journey right. of transformation yeah, that's the other structural shamanic bit that i look at from a comparative perspective i'm not conflating shamans and analysts but there is something profound in the implications of those um, structural similarities across cultures mm-hmm. and when i went through my analysis i actually moved to a different city and did not want to break my <clears throat> excuse me my connection with my analyst so i drove 2 hours each way nice it, it, once a week to see her and i did that for years cuz i moved from cleveland ohio to columbus ohio which is about a 2 hour drive a little over 2 hours and and it was great because i could process mm. i could get that the 2 hour drive there got me into that state where I was just, you know, with myself, I'm alone in the car. And it was just this, this journey through the hills. And then when I left and then would just drive straight home, I processed, you know, what we talked about. And I actually think that that was very beneficial. I didn't just get in the car and drive down the street and then jump back into work. So, and you think that I, would have chosen that. I mean, I, I, I can't believe I did that. Mm. I can't believe I was in analysis for that long. That's not exactly the life I wanted to live. <laughs> but it, I had to. I had to. That yeah. was my, my path. So... Well, Laura, um, speaking of... I'm, I'm glad that was your path because it, it, you know, it ended up with you as you are doing what you do today. And, uh, and on that note, I mean, thank you so much. I'm a huge oh, fan of the show. Um, I'm, I'm, oh, I'm, I appreciate I'm, that. I'm, it's my, one of my absolute favorite podcasts and you are great on Twitter. So we should tell people about both of these things where they can find you and, and where they can find the show and, and so on. Yeah. Well, uh, the podcast can be found at speaking of Jung. Dot com. You can stream it there on the website in your browser, or you can click on the download button and download it to your computer. It's also available on iTunes and all the other podcasting platforms. There's so many. 
And it seems like there's a new one every day that I never heard of. I don't know if that's legal. I don't know if I like it, but it's out there. So it's on Stitcher, Google Play, Podbean, all these other podcasting hosts. And I'm on Twitter as Jungian Laura. That is a long story of how I got that name. It's not my favorite, but it that's the name that came about back in 2010. So it is Jungian Laura. Um, also on Facebook, it's not a Facebook page. It's my Facebook account. I only accept friend requests from people I actually know. So you can follow me. So it's facebook.com slash speaking of Jung. I'm also on Instagram. Um, not much, but I'm there. And I'm on YouTube as well uh, under Jungi and Laura. Wonderful. And all the links are on the website. Yeah, all those links are on the website speakingofjung.com. Yes, and, and they'll be in the show notes here as well. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for your interest. Thank you for saying you love the podcast. I appreciate it so much, Gordon. And thank you very much for your time. You're very welcome. So that's this week's show. Just thinking back to Laura mentioning that idea that Jung is almost too big to be human. And it's not only his voluminous writings over an extremely long career, although that alone would do it. It's the outsized impact across multiple domains beyond psychology uh, into arts and, and film and mythology and astrology and just culture in general. Um, quite often in ways that people assume have just always been there but ultimately lead back to Jung. And I guess that's what I mean by how many Jungs are there or who quote-unquote owns Jung. I'm still not sure if uh, my opinion is fully formed on that yet. But if this sort of thing is your jam, definitely check out Laura's podcast, Speaking of Jung, details in the show notes. There are some really fascinating and deep discussions with professional analysts about broad topics such as narcissism or coping with loss or dreams and dream interpretation and so on. And, uh, and if this sort of thing is your jam, then please do share and subscribe to Rune Soup in your favorite podcatcher or on YouTube. Find us at runesoup.com or the Rune Soup Facebook page and find me on Twitter where I am Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N underscore white, W-H-I-T-E. Until next time. <laughs>